I found the final exam from a course that Carl Sagan taught at Cornell back in 1988, and I think you'll find it interesting. The course was called Astronomy 490, but the questions are not what you would expect for an astronomy course. Instead of being about planets or stars or black holes, this course for astronomy students was about critical thinking. Carl Sagan, of course, was an incredibly influential astronomer and communicator. He taught millions of people about space in his Cosmos TV series. The journey for each of us begins here. But also spearheaded the field of planetary science and assembled the messages sent into space on the Pioneer Plaque and Voyager Golden Record. He's also known for promoting the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and for his many popular books, including Contact. His university course on critical thinking was informed by his strong belief that in order for humanity to thrive in the future, everyday people needed not just a solid education in the sciences, but the ability to think skeptically. So let's take a look at what Sagan thought was important for his students to know. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. For all of the history of mankind, uh, people have wondered about intelligence elsewhere. It always happens in the history of science that as your perspective broadens, you learn more about what you left at home. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Before we read the final exam, let's first take a look at what this course really was. The summary says the course is critical thinking in scientific and non-scientific contexts, with examples from the study of astronomy and other fields. Case studies will include examples of competing hypotheses in the history of science, as well as examples from borderline science and medicine, religion and politics. Stress will be laid on creative generation of alternative hypotheses and their winnowing by critical scrutiny. Winnowing means to find the useful parts of something and to get rid of the rest, so this course is about being open-minded to new ideas, but being able to cut them down to distill only the valuable parts. Sagan says that students will be expected to assimilate an extensive reading list, and the seminars are devoted to the implications of these readings. Here is one surviving copy of that reading list, including Sagan's scribbles. The first required book was On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. This book is a defense of free thought and free speech, and objects to certain interventions from the government. It argues that society should not interfere with individual actions that do not harm others. Individuals should be free to think, speak, and act as they choose, as long as they don't harm others. Sagan devoted a session of the course to discussing Mill and Milgram, pairing the ideas from Mill's book with Stanley Milgram's obedience experiments. These were the experiments which explored the willingness of individuals to obey an authority figure, even when they were asked to do things that conflict with their personal conscience. Participants believed they were administering electric shocks to a learner, who was really an actor, increasing the shock level for each mistake. Many participants obeyed authority and went all the way to the highest voltage, even when the learner was pleading with them to stop. This will be at 3.30. The correct phrase is rich Let me out of boy. Here. Let me out of here. My heart's bothering me. Let me out, I tell you. Let me out of here. Sagan may have paired this with Mill's book on liberty as a way to discuss how, whilst we must value individual liberty and free thought, we can't forget the potential for individuals to be swayed by authority and group dynamics, even to the point of engaging in harmful behavior. The second required reading was Science and the Paranormal by Abel and Singer. This book explored topics like UFOs, the Bermuda Triangle, and psychic healing, often debunking pseudoscientific claims. It actually includes an essay from Carl Sagan himself, as well as from others like Martin Gardner and Isaac Asimov. The third required reading was Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Mackay. Sagan had difficulty obtaining this book since it was out of print, but I found a copy at the library. 
It's an early study of crowd psychology, first published in 1841, and covers an interesting range of topics, including duels, economic bubbles like the Dutch tulip mania, fortune-telling, haunted houses, the influence of religion on the shape of beards and hair, and the popular admiration of great thieves. Its central message is that there is no wisdom in crowds, only madness and fads, saying that people go mad in herds. The next required book was Attacking Faulty Reasoning by Damer. This is a textbook that explains 60 of the most common logical fallacies, defined as something which violates Damer's criteria for a good argument. He says that a good argument must be structurally well-formed, the premises must be relevant, the premises must be acceptable, they must be sufficient in number, weight and kind, and there must be an effective rebuttal of challenges to the argument. The last required reading book was The Evolution of Cooperation by Axelrod. This book uses game theory to explain how mutual cooperation can emerge among self-interested agents or even rival nations. Each week in the class, Sagan's students would discuss controversial topics as a way to practice applying critical thinking skills. Here's the list of topics covered in these sessions. March 9, Palestinian State, something that's as important to discuss today as it was in 1988. The names here seem like a pair of students in the class that were tasked with presenting their thoughts on that topic and leading the debate. March 16, we see, is religion pernicious? Asking if religion does more harm than good. The goal wouldn't be to reach a final verdict on religion, but to practice weighing complex opposing viewpoints. There were also discussions on world hunger, scientific responsibility for global problems, and SDI, which would have been the Strategic Defense Initiative. This was a proposed US missile defense system that would shoot down missiles from space and span the entire Earth. This course was taking place during the Cold War, and this might have been an exercise in evaluating scientific claims under political pressure. Was shooting down nuclear missiles from space even possible? And would deploying such a system make the world safer or more dangerous? The seminar might have linked back to the Evolution of Cooperation book, since it is a kind of cooperation dilemma. That book famously shows that a simple strategy of tit-for-tat, meaning cooperate first, then mirror the other player's last move, often outperforms consistently selfish strategies. Sagan himself spoke out publicly against the SDI scheme and likely encouraged students to spot flawed arguments or wishful thinking in the pro-SDI camp. If we were so foolish as to go ahead with it, I think uh, the net result would be after the expenditure of uh, a million million dollars um, that uh, we would be far less safe than we are today. Uh, and in addition, it is likely to bring about nuclear war itself if uh, the Soviets were to believe, as they say, that it is a uh, part of an American plan for a first strike. Apart from that, it's a terrific idea. <laughs> I wonder what Sagan would have thought about this May 2025 speech in which Trump announced his plans to bring this SDI idea back with a new name, the Golden Dome. Are some of those flawed arguments being recycled, or do we have new science now that changes the feasibility? All the topics on the class schedule are still hot topics today. There's prayer in public schools, and the question, is US education a failure? In the 1980s, reports like A Nation at Risk sparked debates that US schools were falling behind. Sagan's class likely analyzed such claims, such as, are American students really worse off compared to other countries? And what evidence is that based on? If there are problems, then what are the causes? Is it lack of funding, poor curricula, or societal issues outside of schools? Sagan was passionate about improving how science was taught at schools, and even the existence of this course itself showed he thought that critical thinking needed to be better taught too. 
On May 6, 1988, this course's final exam was handed out, and this is what the students received. It is a take-home exam that begins with two quotes, one from Leonardo da Vinci and the other from Martin Luther. The da Vinci quote reads, Anyone who in discussion relies upon authority uses not his understanding, but rather his memory. This is a reminder to trust evidence and understanding over mere authority. The second quote is in a similar vein about faith strangling reason. The exam then asks students to read an entire book, When Prophecy Fails, by Festinger. It is an in-depth study of a UFO cult and how its members handled a failed doomsday prediction. The group was expecting a flood to destroy much of Earth on December 21, 1954. This prophecy came from Marion Keach, the leader of the group. Some believers left their jobs, ended friendships with non-believers, gave away money or possessions, and prepared for their departure on a flying saucer which they believed would rescue them. When the flood didn't happen, and the saucer from Planet Clarion never came, some of the most committed members doubled down and rationalized various explanations to explain why. Others lost belief and left the group. The book studies the cognitive dissonance that people experience when what they believe doesn't align with reality, such as resulting from a failed prophecy. The exam asks you to imagine what would have happened if the events described in the book had gone somewhat differently. So to consider if a charismatic leader, sincere or unscrupulous, your choice, arises in the circle around Marion Keach. And, by chance, there are serious floods on December 21, and or UFOs are widely reported on Christmas Eve. Describe your best estimate of what might have happened as a result of these altered events over the next few years, informed by our readings and class discussions, including the Milgram experiments. So that would mean the students are using everything they read about in the course, including about responding to authority, obedience, crowd psychology, and cognitive dissonance. They'd have to guess at alternative scenarios. Let me know in the comments what you think would have been the most likely outcome here. The second exam question asks students to compose a dialogue, taking place 34 years later, which was now when this exam was given, between a believer in the Clarionite intervention and a skeptic, making the best case possible for both points of view. What lessons, if any, can we draw? That question seems fun to try, and is kind of an exercise in empathy, being able to channel the mindset of a true believer. I can imagine the good answers here made a very convincing argument for them. Sagan says, as usual, there is no single right answer. What I'm looking for is coherency and cogency of argument. I hope you enjoy the assignment. Carl Sagan, May 6, 1988. I also have here the final exam from another year that the course ran, 1986. In this one, students are asked to design and execute an experimental test for astrology, the daily horoscope kind. Sagan doesn't just want students to say astrology is false, he wants them to test it like a scientist would, and think about how they could know if it were true or not. This exam, of course, is not testing memorization of material. Sagan wants his students to think creatively and to think for themselves, applying their own logic. That might seem obvious for any exam, especially one about critical thinking, but I can't help but think about an exam like this being given to students today. How many would take on an automatic fail for asking ChatGPT's advice on the questions? because surely asking AI to think for you should constitute an automatic fail. When something as tempting as AI exists, it's easier than ever to find ourselves thinking sloppily and not for ourselves at all. I was a little surprised to see that all of the weekly discussion topics and exam questions are just as topical and important today as they were when Sagan wrote them for his students. He knew critical thinking was an important skill for people to be able to tackle the world's problems. 
but he didn't even lecture to students who are growing increasingly reliant on outsourcing their thinking. Perhaps a modern version of this course would include books on how language models work, their biases, their quirks, and how they impact our behavior as a way to prepare students for the modern world. After all, surely lessons from the Madness of Crowds book would be relevant for a technology based on crowd consensus and prediction. Sagan himself predicted some of the problems that we face today in 2025. In his last interview, he gave a warning to America about the decline of scientific thinking. That we've arranged a society based on science and technology in which nobody understands anything about science and technology. And this combustible mixture of ignorance and power, sooner or later, is going to blow up in our faces. In Sagan's book, The Demon Haunted World, he talks about his fears for the future. And it's a foreboding I have of an America in my children's generation, or my grandchildren's generation, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few, and no one representing the public interest uh, can even grasp the issues, when the people, the, the people, I mean, the, the broad population in a democracy, when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or even to knowledgeably question those who do so, when there is no practice in questioning those in authority, unable to distinguish between what's true and what feels good, we slide almost without noticing into superstition and darkness. This is, of course, not a problem unique to America. It is human psychology all over the world. Once the science and tech that runs the world around us becomes sufficiently hard to understand, we find it more comfortable to see it as magic, and thus find it easier to believe in other kinds of magic or wishful thinking about scam products or advice. That's why we need to strengthen our toolkit of ways to assess claims for ourselves. The Library of Congress has preserved a list of Sagan's ideas for more ways to prompt students in his critical thinking class. Some of these look at misconceptions in advertising, like more painkilling ingredients than in the competition, when in reality most painkillers only contain one active ingredient, or his thoughts on the tobacco industry. Isn't it remarkable that the Tobacco Institute is able to find scientists who somehow fail to find the correlation between smoking and half a dozen lethal diseases that every other clinician has no difficulty in discovering? I'll put a link in the description where you can check out the rest of this document and all the documents relating to the course, including a couple of pages of Sagan's handwritten notes. If you want to learn more about how AI actually works or about other aspects of science, then check out this video's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant helps you become a better thinker and problem solver with thousands of visual interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. They have a course called How AI Works, which covers topics like prediction, tokenization, and building language models. If these are the topics that people are going to be debating and making decisions about, then we should each at least try to understand them as well as we can. Same goes for Brilliant's course on quantum computing, a subject where having a solid foundation helps you better detect mystical claims. Brilliant helps build your critical thinking skills through problem solving and not memorization. And you can learn either on the computer or on their app, making it easy to incorporate learning into your daily habits. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash tibbies, scan the QR code on screen, or click on the link in the description. Brilliant's also given my viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. Thanks for watching this video and thanks to my Patreon supporters for making it possible. A special shout out to today's Patreon Cat of the Day, Scarlet.